Oh, this is a mascot, by the way. Fake event, but what's your team name? You have your page? Illuminati. Yeah, I got it. Give me your page. Hey, do y'all have your page? Your DFL team? Oh, Quaker Band. Y'all have it. Y'all have it. Hey, yes, I like to dance to the camera. Ooh, a genius. Can you get Jesus to start the classroom? He's bleeding, so. Well, <laughs> What's your team name? Team Omar. That's really the right. Team name is our team name. Well, write that down on your page for me. Then. Okay. Uh, Omar, you got that page for me? Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right, all right. Here we go. So I'll, I'll get your BFL page at the end of class. That's fine. Okay. Today we're still marching along to the Civil War. And this video I'm about to show you, we're going to start class with kind of a funny video. This video I'm about to show you is why I care about teaching you so much. So I know sometimes i got a lot of things to say, a lot of stories to tell. This video is why I care about teaching you so much. So keep that in mind as you watch it. Ready, set, here we go. All these questions are from Guy Alley, an app that helps you learn general knowledge. First question, who was the president during the American Civil War? Wait, 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 no, no. no. It's Kennedy. Kennedy. Think so? Are you like 100% sure? Right. John F. Kennedy. Is wrong. No more. That's wrong. No, it's not. That's not Andrew Jackson. No, it's Abraham Lincoln. It's not Abe Lincoln. It was Andrew Jackson. What's the final answer? Andrew Jackson. Some Jackson. Jackson. All right, we'll go Andrew Jackson. That's wrong. Abe Lincoln was the correct answer. I knew that. Or, um, I don't know. I don't know. We're out. We're out already. We're out. Amber who? Amber here. Lincoln? Oh, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, that's right. Oh. We studied it. Remember, we studied it in class. Abraham Lincoln? Yeah, yeah Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, that's correct. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You guys are doing it. President during the Civil War was the question. And I hope you. We're sick of black and You know the answer, right? You know the answer. Abraham Lincoln. That right there is why I care about teaching you so much. You will not leave this class without knowing key people from history. You, if you ever get approached by a dude with a camera and a microphone on the beach, are going to have the right answer. Now, I know they probably highlighted the people who gave the funniest answers and all that kind of stuff. Maybe someone got the right answer and they didn't make my video. But that's my why, guys. Okay, I want you to walk out of here with an understanding of the story of us, and that is going to lead us to today's conversation about key personalities from the Civil War. So I got a lot to say, short amount of time. Here is uh, here's how you should take notes today. I want you to write pretty much the first slide. Ooh, that's not good. I dropped this last clock. Quick dropping. I'll give you one. We'll donate one. That's so good. They keep going with it all. It works. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, got, I didn't fall out of any chairs, so. <laughs> I know I should have recorded yesterday. <laughs> you, can't, you know the rule of cameras. Like so when you're a parent and you're trying to get a cute picture of your kid, they will do all the cute things when you don't have a camera out. And they will do none of the cute exactly. things. Exactly. That's the rule of cameras. So uh, that's why something funny happens when I think. Sure. I'm going to need to do one by Christmas for sure. All right, key figures of the Civil War. Leading figures of the Civil War is what I'm calling today. And we're going to go over three main categories, which is what's in front of you. Abolitionists, politics, and then the military. Okay? It's one of those things where I got a lot to say. I got a lot up here and not enough time for it to all come out here. Yes. So we'll go as rapidly as we can. And keeping that first video in mind, I just want to inform you. I want to teach you about key people and the story of your country, and that's the big why on today. So, been to the video. Abolition. What is an abolitionist? A person who does not like slavery. Someone who's opposed to slavery. Someone who is systematically opposed to the institution of slavery. Now, that's not to say that every northerner is an abolitionist. There are people in the north who maybe didn't care. That's not to say every southerner was a slave owner. Here's what's uh, also kind of confusing. This comes from that religious movement known as what? Second Great Awakening. Second Great Awakening. Generally a religious movement. But guess what? This is not even to say that every Christian was an abolitionist. In fact, unfortunately, which this is kind of a conversation for another day, but there were Christians who were slave owners 
there were Christians who used the Bible to advocate for slavery. So abolition is not just one size fits all. You could be from the north, from the south. You could be a Christian. You could not be a Christian. What you were in favor of was abolishing slavery. A couple of key abolitionists is who we're going to talk about. We're going to start with Frederick Douglass. So as you take notes today, the first screen of each person is probably what you need to write. If there's something else that you should write down, I will let you know. I know some of you are very diligent about writing exactly what's on the screen. Uh, if I say anything extra or interesting, extra or interesting, you're welcome to write it down. Frederick Douglass was born into slavery. Uh, he was born in Maryland. And do you remember the different chunks of the states? What what type of a state was Maryland? Border. Um, border um, yeah. state, that's right. So it stayed in the Union, but it did have slavery. Well, Frederick Douglass escaped slavery at age 20. He went north to New York City. What he did was he snuck onto a train, and he rode the train all the way to New York City. And at that time, he was, he was free in New York. It was a free state. So he is a natural abolitionist, having been in slavery and escaped it, obviously he's gonna to wanna to share with other people uh, about, the, about the horrors of slavery, and then also to try to advocate for doing away with slavery. Frederick Douglass, he was a, you know, we talked about the difference between writers and fighters. He was not a fighter. He was, he was not one that picked up a gun, he was a writer. He was a speech giver. And he was a, he's a really aggressive writer and speech was giver. He, uh, Uncle Tom, Uncle, um, some, hang on to that. He's not associated with that directly, but hang on to that because she's coming up. Um, Frederick Douglass, here's a part of his life story is that he was separated from his family at age six. He started living with his maternal grandmother, but at age six, he was separated from her. So at age six, that is the same age that Salem is. Okay, so I think about Salem being age six. That's when he was separated from all of his blood relatives. At that point, he was around strangers. And, you know, what a terrible, terrible life to live that highlights the horrors of slavery. So in escaping slavery, he wanted a lot of other people to know how bad it was, and he wanted to advocate for the abolition of slavery altogether. He did know Abraham Lincoln. That's part of his life story is that he got to meet Lincoln and talk directly with Lincoln. In fact, Lincoln was, uh, uh, Lincoln was kind of a disappointment to Frederick Douglass. When you want something, I know what James is saying is going to be. When you want something, when do you want it? Now. Now, yeah. Well, Frederick Douglass wanted the abolition of slavery now. He really wanted it yesterday, right? If that was even possible. Lincoln was a little bit slower in coming around to emancipation, and he tied it to the military strategy, whereas Douglass just wanted him to declare outright emancipation. So, you know, they were compadres. They talked. I would even say that they were friends, but uh, they they also d debated and disagreed with each other in certain ways as well. But Kind of notable that uh, they knew each other, okay? Two famous people who knew each other at this time. Frederick Douglass also knew, I'm gonna show you a couple pictures from his life along the way here. Frederick Douglass also knew John Brown. In fact, he was a mentor to John Brown, and he helped John Brown plan the raid uh, at Harper's Ferry, which went off in 1859. So he wasn't there, but he helped John Brown plan that. So he knew a lot of famous people, and you know, as history looks back on those lives, the way that they intersected with each other is pretty significant. This is a picture you may recognize of Frederick Douglass, maybe a little bit more than the others. His hair is kind of famous and iconic. He's got that gray stripe going through his hair. Um, as we look at these people, we're going to look at some of the quotes that they said, because I think that's the best way to look at someone, is to see what they actually said. Here's a quote from him. He says, knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. What do you think he means by that? Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. What's he in favor of? Knowledge. Wait, say that. The fact that we can like, uh, think and comprehend ideas makes us safe. Thinking, comprehending ideas. What would he be in favor of? What helps you gain knowledge? School. School. He was in favor of that second Great Awakening reform movement for public education. And he is saying that a big reason slave owners don't let their slaves go to school is because an educated African American population would rise up and not allow themselves to be slaves anymore. Here's the other thing he was saying. He's saying that in his day, people didn't have the right to go to school, and they were dying to go to school. You, be honest, how many of you woke up today, and you hit the alarm, and you're like, oh my god, I've got to go to school again. I have to go to school. That's what, James, you get to go to school. He and his family and his offspring would have loved to go to school. You get to go to school. So. 
don't know if that's really going to land on you guys here in this room right now. You have the privilege of going to school. You have the opportunity to go to school. You have the right to go to school. Many, many people across time in history have been prevented from getting an education, and they wished that they could have had an education. Here's another one for you. He says, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Sounds like something that a coach might say, right? A football coach or a sports coach of any sort. What do you, what do you think he meant by this? What kind of struggle is he referring to? What kind of struggle are African Americans going through right now? Yeah, right? The big one. I mean, they're fighting for their freedom. So I think what, what he's also saying is that sometimes something's so close to you that all you feel is the struggle, all you feel is the bad. If you open your eyes a little bit, look a little bit outward see the progress is being made. So when we're struggling, we are all, we also are making progress. Think about it from a real simple perspective in the weight room, right? If you're lifting weights or working out, you're struggling to lift that weight, but what's happening to your body? But what's happening to your just You're making progress over time. Real key word there, yeah. So when you struggle, you are making progress. That's pretty significant. Make sure for time, I'll skip a couple things along the way here. All right, moving along to uh, Alex. Who is this young lady on the screen? Uh, the name right there. Her name is Harriet Beecher Stowe, but Alex, what is she known for? Uncle Tom's cabin. Yeah, he mentioned that a second ago. That's why I picked on him. She, now, first of all, she's notable because why? She's a she. She's a she. PJ's catching up on my phrases here. Yeah, she's a she. In a man's world, she is a woman who used her voice and her talents to write something pretty significant. And what she writes is this book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin was a very vivid, descriptive depiction of the horrors of slavery. And it's a fictional story. Okay, it's not true, but it is rooted in a lot of the slave practices of the time. Whippings and lashings and selling people and splitting up families and rape and incest. All the bad things that were going on in slavery, a lot of northerners kind of turned a blind eye to. Right? They're like, that's the weird thing from the South. It doesn't affect me. I don't have slaves. It's it's whatever. It doesn't affect me. Well, reading Uncle Tom's Cabin opened their eyes, and they could they could now see that, wow, we got to do something about this. This is terrible. A lot of Southerners, even though they were invested in slavery, maybe they didn't know how terrible it was. So a lot of Southerners who read this book, uh, maybe their family owned slaves. Maybe they were kind of uh, insulated from the horrors of slavery. If they lived in the house, they didn't necessarily work in the fields, and they didn't know that the whippings went on. They didn't know that the selling happened. They didn't know how terrible slavery was. But then they read this book, and they're like, oh my gosh, my family owns slaves, and this is what slavery is really like. So a lot of Southerners had their eyes open as well. Uncle Tom Cabin really increases the abolition movement because of how descriptive it is. Pretty notable, pretty cool that a fictional story can be so descriptive and really change the world in such a way. Here's a, here's a cover of it. The story follows this, um, the, the main character is Uncle Tom, he's a black slave. He actually works in the house. So in slavery, there's kind of a distinction between house slaves and then the field working slaves. Well, Uncle Tom is the, the narrator of the story and he kind of tells the horrors of slavery. And, Something unique about the story is that he he's really kind of responsible for raising the young girl in the family. And isn't that a weird thing where you own slaves, but then you also give them the responsibility for raising your children? White people do that. And a lot of times the house slaves were actually raising the white children. So are we good? Are we track? A lot of times the, the, the house slaves would raise the family's children, and it kind of captures that relationship. He's an enslaved African man. He is raising this young girl, and together they kind of witness the horrors of slavery. And all together, it just goes, it shows the country how bad slavery is. Here's a quote from her. We're still looking at quotes from these people. She says, I feel now is the time to come when even a woman or a child who can speak a word for freedom and humanity is bound to speak. I hope every woman who can write will not be silent. She's saying, if you have a voice, if you have something to say, speak it. You better speak it. You have the demand, you have the obligation to use your voice and speak. And again, what's notable is that she's a she in a male-dominated society. And you know who else she includes? She includes young people. Maybe a lot of time in your life you've been told that you're too young to make a difference or you know, you're know you not an adult yet. She says if you see something going on and you have a voice to use, 
better speak up in the interests of all freedom and humanity. So I think that's pretty cool, uh, the whole story of Harry Beecher Stowe's life. Uh, she uh, interacts with Abraham Lincoln one time as well. In 1862, she goes to the White House and she visits the president. And it's kind of hard for us to imagine. It's just different in that time. You could literally just walk up to the White House and get an audience with the president. So that's what she does. She goes in and she meets the president. And uh, now he knew who she was. Okay, because she was famous throughout the country. But they never met each other yet. Something about her is that she was kind of physically small, right? She was probably five two, five three. She's a teeth, if you James will. Yeah. I'm five three. Thank you. Like I said, shape size. Hey. So she's a little smaller. And what do we know about Lincoln? Physically, he's tall. Okay, so there's a physical difference between the two of them. Well, when she walks in and she meets the president, he says, "So you're the little woman who wrote that book and made this great war." And that's that's a compliment. He's saying that even though you're small in size, you wrote this book and you led the country to this conversation, not war, right? He's not saying she caused the war, but he's saying that even though you're small, you're mighty, and you led us to the situation that we're in today, which is wrestling with slavery and fighting a war over it. So she was respected by him, and she got to meet him in 1862 as well. All right, we're cruising. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can literally hear the click of this point. Uh, John Brown. Now, we've already spoken of John Brown, so I'm not going to rehash too much of the, what we've already said, but we will, uh, we'll just add a little bit to the John Brown story as well. We know he gets his start in Kansas, uh, and at the time it is called Bleeding Kansas because you have the rabid abolitionists fighting against the border hoppers, the border ruffians. And Kansas is literally voting for its own future. It's voting whether it'll be a free state or a slave state. And people like John Brown were trying to make a mess for those who wanted to vote it to be a slave state. And John Brown, he believed he was on a mission from God, and his mission was to end slavery. So what he does is he drags uh, certain slave-owning families into the street in the middle of the night, and he and his sons kill them right there because they were slave owners, and John Brown and his sons were abolitionists. So I'm not sure if that's the most Christian thing to do, although you were dealing with the horrors of slavery. Uh, that's what he does in Kansas. He kills five people. He is not prosecuted in Kansas. He does not go to trial or anything like that because that was kind of the nature of bleeding Kansas at the time. He takes his mission. He takes his slave, rebe slave rebellion Virginia. idea all the way to Virginia, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they take over an arsenal. What's an arsenal? Uh Stronghold. Uh, yeah, I mean, it could be a stronghold. What it really is is a building with guns and ammo, just like Alex said. And here's what John Brown was hoping for. They got into the arsenal, and he was hoping that a whole bunch of runaway slaves would come and join them. And as the slaves came and joined them, he'd give them a rifle. And then all of a sudden, you would have, a sl you would have an army on your hands. Here's what didn't happen. A bunch of people didn't come and join him. So they got into the arsenal, and then what happened? They got surrounded by people. They got surrounded by who? Us. By the U.S. Army, by us, and who was leading the U.S. Army? Uh, Big hey, figure Abraham. in the Civil War, Colonel Robert, Robert E. Lee. Lee. Yeah, oh, well, the U.S. Much. Army. This was before Robert E. left, uh, and it was Robert E. Lee of the U.S. Army. So inside the arsenal, they're surrounded. They are arrested. Remarkably, none of John Brown's men are killed, but they all go to trial, and at trial, they are convicted. And when they're convicted, they're sentenced to hang. But uh, going to trial was kind of significant. Because when John Brown went to trial, what do you think he had the chance to do? Speak his mind. That's right. At trial, he had the chance to tell his story. He had the chance to bring God into the conversation. He had the chance to tirade against slavery. And uh, TJ, like how you said, it, tell his story. He had the chance to tell his story. So maybe going to trial was the best thing that could have happened because he got to share his message. Yeah. Uh, we did look at a couple pictures of John Brown. So here's young John Brown. And what did we say about his characterization here? He looks, what's that? Was you the one that said that? All day I've been trying to think who said that. Yeah, at least he said he looked like me. Uh, he's got his book. You know, I think he looks like a Sunday school teacher, right? He's just clean cut John Brown. Well, fast forward a little bit, and how does he change? Grows the beard, and he gets a little rugged, but is, would you say that's the same person? Yeah. I mean, arguably, yeah, it's the same person. However, how does he get portrayed in modern art and media? Crazy uh, Joseph. Yeah, crazy eyes. Moses. 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 Moses, right? Moses freeing his people. He's got a Bible in one hand and a rifle in the other. 
Crazy. stomping on people on you know during his campaign. Crazy John Brown is how he's portrayed. This is one portrayal. This next portrait, though, you've already seen this. This is called The Last Moments of John Brown. How is he portrayed in this picture? Kissing, Kissing a black baby. Kissing a black baby. Admired. Yes. He's on the way to his death right here. Okay? He's walking to the gallows where he'll be hung. But the portrait here shows, shows that he's caring for African Americans, shows him as grandfatherly, shows him as a martyr, really, right? Also, he kind of changed his skin Also, oh, yeah. you know, the picture does so show his skin. Yeah. He was not a black man. He was not, right? He wasn't half black or anything like that. He looks mean, but, but he's the not. picture there, say it again? He looks mean, but he's not. Looks a little haggard and mean. But also, he's super not. tall, man. Anybody have a, a grandpa tall. that's maybe a little bit rougher around the edges, but it's not necessarily mean? Yeah. Yeah, all right. He switched teams. Like you would he's think, like, now he's he's like, like, he might be the type to not support. <laughs> So what's the lesson there, man? What do you So just to round out the story of John Brown, he is hung. He becomes a martyr because of it. In fact, uh, I think it's uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson compares the gallows to the cross, saying he almost has this Jesus-like persona. You know, he's taking on the martyrdom for African Americans. And uh, uh, something also notable, James, something also notable about his hangings, how many people were there? Who else was there that we talked about? Oh, uh, the guy who killed Lincoln. John Wilkes Booth yeah. was present, that's right. And uh, another key Robert E. Lee. <clears throat> Robert E. Lee was there as the captor, yep. And then we also said Stonewall Jackson was there. So yeah. it was almost like a lot of people were there. Uh, it's almost like the precursor to the start of the Civil War. It's not even how many people were there. So, John Brown, we've already talked we've talked about him and me the key abolitionist. Leads me to, I love talking about this one, Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman and John Brown actually knew each other. Harriet Tubman was supposed to be at John Brown grade, but she got sick and didn't go. And quite frankly, that probably that saved her life. And that's good because of how much she did in her life that was uh that was important. I feel like um, if right? she went, she would have brought like people with her. Ooh, but that's that's a good thought, Alex. He's saying if she went, maybe she would have brought more people with her, which is what he was looking for in the first place. So hmm, Alex, I've never thought of it like that. That kind of challenges my thought. Maybe that brain, maybe it would have been Sorry. different if she went. That's good. Hey, there's a reason this class is my favorite. The reason I like this class the most. Uh, Harry Tubman, she was born in Maryland, so just like Frederick Douglass, that's a border state. She escaped her slavery when she was 19 years old uh, via the Underground Railroad. Now, when I say the Underground Railroad, do I mean toot -toot, train? What do I mean by the Underground Railroad? They, they let it not to escape going through people's homes. Like of people to help them. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll bother with that. Train, oh, like train. Oh, love it, love it, love it. Yeah, uh, TJ. I was gonna say like <laughs> his secret like way to get to free states or Canada is just be like, like a a, at certain stops yeah. like houses like they used to have quilts that would have certain patterns in them that the slaves would know that somewhere that we can rest for the night. All that TJ reads a lot. He tell reading. And you don't want to say that you weren't smart. At reading much. is good. Reading is good. It helps all of us. Yeah, it's the only thing he's smart James and TJ combined, you said all of it. It was not a railroad, okay? Calling it a railroad was actually like a secret code language. So that regular people might not know that you were talking about slaves escaping. And exactly what TJ said, a series of houses, uh, people who were facilitating the escape were called conductors. And when Harriet Tubman escaped via the Underground Railroad, she then became committed to helping others escape. And she became she, a conductor. So I would write this one. I think this is an important slide. She became what? a conductor. TJ, go ahead. And another thing, tying back in to stuff we've already learned, the Quakers. Like, uh -huh. what about them? <laughs> no, go for it. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. The Qu the Quakers, since they were such a um, peace loving kind of people, they were a lot of the times the like in the area that they were usually at. In the country, they were the people who would mainly help the slaves. Very good ad. And I will throw in this is a little extra. Harry Beecher Stowe. Uh, Harry Beecher Stowe's story is hinged on Quakers as well. In Uncle Tom's Cabin, Quakers are the ones who kind of change the attitude 
of the main characters. And so yeah, Quakers, uh, we've been talking about them for a long time. That's a, that's a great connection right there. Harry Tubman, she goes on to be a conductor. She got rescued and she wants to help rescue others as well. And we'll never know for sure because it wasn't like they were keeping records, but anywhere between 70 to 300 people were led to freedom by Harry Tubman on the Underground Railroad. You know, they weren't keeping records because technically it was a crime. So it's not like you want to keep record of all the crimes you're doing. But anywhere between 70 and all the way up to 300 people, she led to freedom on the Underground Railroad. Pretty cool. I'm trying to make a difference to like one person in my life, maybe. The fact that she led 70, maybe up to 300 people to, to freedom, that's pretty cool. Tell you a little bit about how she did it. And, uh, you know, she, she held many roles during the war. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to add to this slide in just a second. But I want to tell you how she led on the Underground Railroad. You guys really like this story right here. So she was tough. She was definitely a boss babe. I know I said that about Dolly Madison. I was going to say something else, but it's not something I say. Something. We'll just go with boss babe. All right, we'll go with boss babe. She was a leader of men. She was a leader of white people even at that, right? People trusted her. They followed her instincts. They followed her knowledge. When she was leading people on the Underground Railroad, she would carry a pistol. And when you committed to go with Harry Tubman, you, you had to go. If you went halfway and got cold feet and you were going to turn back, well, when you got you back, know. when you got back to your plantation, they might beat you and try to get information out of you, right? So if you were going to go with Harry Tubman, you better be committed to go. Now, every now and then, someone did get cold feet or got nervous or they wanted to turn back. That's when Harry Tubman would pull the gun out. She pointed down the bridge of the guy's nose and she would say, get back in line. We're going north because she wasn't going to have someone turn back and give away all of her information. So that's one tough thing that she would do. So basically, she's just awesome. Basically, she's awesome. Here's another cool thing. So she also rescued a bunch of babies, right? And sometimes family family groups would go together. How many of y'all have a younger sibling you're dealing with right now, right? Like babies who are crying. Can you get them to shut up on demand? No. Answer is no. Actually, yes. No. You can no, choke them out of no, windows, no. and you don't have to deal with it. this guy. So the answer is no, right? And of course, you're not going to choke the baby out. That wouldn't be. That would be out the window. Out. Hey, him out. James, more about that. How about this? Let's say that you are being pursued and someone is coming towards you, and the baby, the crying baby, is about to give you away. That's oh, not, yeah. a good, not a good situation, right? So to prevent that situation from even coming out, she never choked out any babies, and she didn't throw them out the window. Here's what she did: she would give them sleeping medication. And by, <laughs> by sleeping medication, I mean cocaine. Nice! <laughs> you give them a little bit of codeine or cocaine. And hey, I know it's weird to us today because it's a drug, it's a substance. But back, back then, it wasn't just it wasn't quite the same controlled substance. I mean, she would, genu she would genuinely give them a small dose of cocaine in order to put them to sleep so that they wouldn't give away their, their position. Right. Oh, that's that not what I thought it was. The entire period up until like the 1920s, it, it literally came in chewing gum. Yeah, Keep by the way, Coca-Cola had cocaine in it as well. Yeah, just a small. 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 No, no small. wonder no wonder people now either a vegan or a Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, yeah. Coke, yeah. Coca-Cola. Anyway, so photo boss thing. Can we agree to that? Right, sure. So lamps. Um, other things she did more than just being more than just being a uh, conductor on the Underground Railroad. During the war itself, she was a nurse. She was a spy and she was a guy. And you know what's really cool about that is that white people put their trust in her. White men, right? Think about the era that we're in. It's a man's world, it's a white person's world. So the fact that they would follow an African American female, she must have been pretty trusted, right? Or the fact that they would even say, hey, we trust you to take us through this trail, through this stream, she would be pretty trusted. This picture is not a true picture. This is from a movie called Harriet, and it is a very good movie. I think it's underrated. You know, how you know there's like big Hollywood box office hits that you hear about? This one, I never really heard about until I researched it. It is a very good movie. It, I think it shows how awesome she is, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure it's on something like Amazon or Netflix. I've or, seen it. It's pretty good. You've seen it? It's pretty good? Here's a true-to-life quote. This is not just a movie, but this is true-to-life. She said, I never ran my train off the track, and I never yeah. lost a passenger. So all the people she rescued, nobody died along the way. And she was very proud of that. She was very proud that everyone she tried to rescue, she did give them all the way to freedom. Harry she Tubman had two awesome nicknames. One of the nicknames was Moses. They called her Moses. 
So those of you with a little bit of you know Bible know-how, or it's really not even Bible, it's just world history. Why would they call her Moses? What was Moses? Led people she led the people to out of Moses slavery. Moses led the Hebrews out of, slavery. out of slavery, and Harriet Tubman led her people out of slavery into freedom. So that's the first nickname. The second nickname I think is pretty awesome. It, came, it was given to her by John Brown. So we just talked about John Brown. John Brown, anytime he referenced Harriet Tubman, he called her the general. He referred to her as the general, which is a, there's, at this time, there were no women generals. So that is a big deal for him to defer to her as the general. It kind of spoke to how cool she was uh, overall. This is a portrait that's in her hometown, and I think it's a very beautiful painting. What, is it, what does it kind of say to you? Yeah, she's reaching, and she's going she's gonna to grab you out of slavery and pull you into freedom. Is that freedom. a pretty picture? Uh, it's painted in a way that it is, yeah, right? It, it looks like she's coming uh, out of the wall. I have not visited Dorchester, but I know that they have a whole Harriet Tubman trail set up. Not just one museum, but like you can follow. Field trip. Follow, yeah, field trip. Let's go. I'm in. Let's figure out how to raise the money. Let's go. Um, sale. Finally, are you curious how long she lived? She lived, years. she lived until 1913, and she was 93 years old. How she, lived, young? <laughs> she lived well past the Civil War. She lived well past abolition, and I think she got to see the fruits of her labor. You know, some people died before the slaves were free. They never really got to see their work accomplished, but she got to see her work accomplished, and don't hate me. <laughs> <Did I go? laughs> Why they do Harry Tubman like that? <laughs> God, I can't unsee it. Can't unsee it. <laughs> How do we honor Harry Tubman? How are we going to honor Harry Tubman? We're thinking about putting on 20 We are thinking bills. about it is a good way to put it, James. I don't know why it's taking so no, long. No, keep it made on $20. But oh. you've already made the agreement with me. Well, when you get a Harry Tubman 20, what are you going to do? Just the sponsor you. You're going to call yeah, up your old like history all teacher, all and I'm going to feel yeah, they do, actually. I'm going to feel good that you remembered something from your U.S. history class. Hopefully someday I'll That's be able to. Please. Yeah, we need a female there. president so I can shut James up. No. Y'all males, they're going to say males. Oh, People like James will shut up. Exactly. Hopefully someday I'll be able to teach this class with an actual Harry Tubman 20 and actually show it to you, but for now it's still just a concept. Oh, so sure. there you have it. Harry Tubman, 93 years old. Pretty significant figure talk to in the Civil War. All right, we're going to pause right there, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the two presidents. Ah, that's right. I'm not so sure about that one.
about the two key leaders, the political leaders, the president of each country. We will start with Abraham Lincoln, the many faces of Abraham Lincoln. Now, to talk about Abraham Lincoln in the U.S. history class, I mean, think about the books that have been written about Lincoln. Millions of pages, right? Documentaries. Thousands of hours. You can't possibly hit Abraham Lincoln in like 10 minutes, right? But what I am going to do, I'm going to tell you about a couple things you probably didn't know about Abraham Lincoln before. We'll start with the obvious, and then we'll go to the couple of things that you probably haven't ever heard of before. So here's the obvious. Uh, this should be pretty simple to know. The election of 1860 divided the country. He becomes the 16th president of the United States. Ask Selah, she's not going to come in here today, but ask Selah who the 16th president of the United States is. She will say Abraham Lincoln. Okay, so I'm not impressed if you know that. Everybody should know that. Uh, we know that he was determined to preserve the Union, not necessarily the abolition of slavery at first, but his first priority was to preserve the Union. These are the basics, right? These are the basics about Abraham Lincoln. But I am going to tell you, we're going to go into a couple of things that are a little bit, no. little, I won't, we're going into a couple of things that are a little bit deeper than just the basics. And while you're still writing, I'll tell you, we'll briefly re review the Emancipation Proclamation. Talked about it yesterday, but we'll review it. We're going to talk about the um, um, uh, writ of habeas corpus, and I bet that's a phrase you're not familiar with, so you better better lean into it if you're not familiar with it, because it is important. And then we're going to talk about his unity speeches. He gives a lot of speeches, but a couple of them are most notable. We're going to talk about the speeches that, that refer to unity. TJ? Um, I like how you said, like, at first, it was mainly preserving the union, because I remember... Uh, watching this video, and it is quoted in a quote from Abraham Lincoln and a quote from Robert E. Lee mm -hmm. around the same time. Abraham Lincoln said that if he could preserve the United States without freeing a single slave, he would. And Robert E. Lee, e. Lee said later on, if he could free every slave and end the war, he would. But he knew Jefferson Davis would never go for that. TJ, that's a great point, and I'd be curious to see exactly what you're referring to. Um, I got I got a Lincoln quote in my brain. I'm going to try to get it right. Very close to what you were saying. Lincoln said this, and, and TJ's conclusion is exactly right. Lincoln was not, a, was not, Lincoln was truly not an abolitionist, okay? Abolitionists were dedicated exclusively to the abolition of slavery. Lincoln's first perspective was to preserve the Union. And TJ, I think I'll get the quote right. He says, if I could free all the slaves and preserve the Union, I would do it. If I freed none of the slaves to preserve the Union, I would do it. If I could free some of the slaves to preserve the Union, I would do it. Point is, whatever category, you want to preserve the Union. And then the Lee quote, I don't know that off the top of my head, but I'll buy it. That's, that sounds pretty similar. Yep, great thought. Great connection. I wish I had eight TJs in here. I'm just kidding. I'll let the rest of y'all too. Uh, so, all right, so the things I said we're going to talk about. First is going to be the review of the Emancipation Proclamation. Come on, clicker. There it is. Talked about this yesterday, okay? Lincoln did this out of military necessity. We know him as the great emancipator. We know that he did free the slaves, and that becomes his big goal. But he has to do it strategically, and he does it by declaring freedom for which slaves? No one's done yeah. the union. Opposite. No. And then both of us. Slaves in the rebelling states. So what, what type of state did that not include? Border states. border states, right? Because if he freed their slaves, they might just turn on him and join the South. So while we know him as the great emancipator, this proclamation really actually doesn't do a lot. Because if you're in deep Alabama, are you going to listen to what that tyrant up, up north had to say? No. Oh, well, okay. King Abe thinks he can tell me what to do with my property. You're not going to listen to him. Until, until the Union started sweeping into the South and winning some battles... As they moved forward, they freed the slaves that they came to. When Sherman marched, marched across Georgia, 
he freed the slaves on, on the territory he was marching through. But initially, it was largely sentimental. Now, it was designed to cripple the South economically, and it was really designed to inspire slaves to run north. They knew that if they could make it to Union territory, territory that the Union Army was in control of, they would then be free. So that idea could inspire them to run north and cripple the South economically. But this was not the freedom for all African Americans that would come a little bit later. So that is the Emancipation Proclamation, super key to know that it only related to the slaves in the rebelling states. All too often, students will say freed the slaves. Half true, you got to know that it was only the slaves in the rebelling states. So that's a bit of a review. Now here's something new. The, ha the writ of habeas corpus. Lincoln demonstrates extreme executive strength by suspending the writ of habeas corpus. Every president, yeah, and I was just like, I do not know Avla. I don't even understand what that means. It's a Latin. It's a Latin phrase. Okay, so I have to explain what the Latin phrase means, and I will in just a second. Every president has had to decide how much power do I have. Thomas Jefferson, we know he stretched the Constitution by purchasing Louisiana. Every president so far has had to decide how much power do I have. Lincoln, being a wartime president, and it's a war at home, he decided he did some things that he wouldn't have done outside of war. But since we were at war, he says, I can suspend normal civil liberties, and I can proclaim some of these by executive order. One of these things was suspending habeas corpus. So, Alex, let me explain it to you. What you got, James? Uh, I'll let you that, that went on. Yeah, so in, on Lincoln in particular, I've already broken it down with what I want you to write down. So I definitely want you to write down, write, write down this about habeas corpus. It's a Latin phrase that means show me the body. Corpus sounds like corpse, the body. Habeas means show me. Now, it's not referring to a dead body, but it's referring to when you are arrested, you have to go stand before a judge and be charged with a crime. Show me the body. It means you can't arrest someone and put them in jail and never charge them with a crime. Well, Lincoln, during this time, did exactly that. To his political opponents, he would arrest them, put them in jail, not charge them with a crime, and he left them there for the rest of the war. Sounds a whole lot like who? Andrew Jackson, what the sports is? Eh, mm -hmm. John. Oh, John Adams. Oh, wait a second. Didn't we say we don't like John Adams? Didn't we say that the Sedition Act was stomping on the Bill of Rights? Yeah. Wait a second. How is Lincoln doing the exact same thing? Lincoln has a really mixed reputation in history. I know your third grade teaching of Lincoln is Honest Abe, and he has his beard, and he freed the slaves. Lincoln, in reality, just like all historical figures, has a mixed reputation. Some love him, some hate him. Some of, his, some of the things he did we can understand through the lens of 2022. Some of the things he did were like, whoa, that would never fly in 2022. Of course, we have to understand that he lived in the 1860s, and we can't bring our presentism to uh, to that conversation. But he suspends. So this is the writ of habeas corpus. Okay, I explained it to you first. He suspended it. He put his political opponents in jail, mostly those in the border states. He didn't necessarily have the ability to reach into the southern states until his army got there. But in the border states, like Maryland and Kentucky and Missouri, he, uh, he imprisoned people who wrote against him or spoke against him. And he left them there till the end of the war. So sometimes students say, is this still a thing today? Well, no, because it ended when the war ended. Today, if you're trolling the streets tonight, James, and you get picked up, you would expect to stand before a judge within 24 hours, right? To be told what you're being charged with. That's what wasn't happening during the Civil War. You could be arrested. You could be held in custody. If you've already written down most of it, don't bother with this one. I've kind of already said it. But he suspended this right uh, where you could be imprisoned without charges and without a trial date. So that's not exactly the Abraham Lincoln that you're probably used to hearing about, right? The good guy. This is one of those more controversial things that he did during the war. Here's the other, here's the other thing we're going to talk about. This is a little bit more positive. Lincoln gave speeches that had the theme of unity. Gettysburg Address, we talked about that yesterday. Instead of, hey, we won, you suck, we're good, yeah, dancing on the graves of the Confederates, the Gettysburg Address is designed to convey that we're all coming together, right? Let's be a nation of one people. That's Gettysburg Address. James? Let's go on the unity speeches. That's right. 
And then the other unity speech that I need to tell you about is his second inaugural address. The inauguration is when you get sworn in and you become the president. 1864, he wins his second election. So in his inauguration, he gives another speech focused on unity. Not we win, you lose, we're good, you're bad, but it was a focus on unity. It was all about finding, healing the wounds of the war that we've just come through. Let's come back together as one country. Uh, and he was speaking pretty directly to Southerners, right? Victory was inevitable for the Union, and he wanted everybody to know that we're not going to punish you. We're not going to execute you. We just want everybody to come back together. So if I was a guessing man, and I genuinely do not know the EOC, okay? I don't know what's on it. But if I was a guessing man, I would guess that something about Abraham Lincoln will be on the EOC, okay? That's too important to not be on the EOC. And I would suggest that this would probably be a passage that could be on the test. You don't need to have the speech memorized, and we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna go over the whole speech. But you, if you see anything about Gettysburg Address or the Second Inaugural Address, you should think that unity, Lincoln and unity. I don't know how the test is written. I don't know what's on it. I don't know the phrasing of the questions or anything like that. But if I was a guessing man, I would guess that this is pretty ripe for a potential EOC question. And, uh, and don't freak out if you see a long passage. Think through it, slow down, Lincoln, unity, something like that would be the correct answer. I believe in you, you can do this. Here's some actually phrasing from the speech. No need to write this down. He says, with malice towards none, okay, with anger towards no one, with charity towards all, with firmness in what is right, let us strive on to finish the work that we are in, binding up the nation's wounds. Let's heal, let's be one people again. This is the theme of the second inaugural. This picture right here, I love it. You know I love historical pictures. Uh, can you see Lincoln in this picture right here? Can you tell which one he is? Uh, right down the middle. He is right in the middle. middle. Yeah, so you can see the podium, and then Lincoln is standing up reading his speech. Now, what's different about this picture versus what you would expect to see at an inauguration today? He's surrounded by people. Surrounded by people is exactly right. So today, no security... Cameras. Bulletproof light, no cameras is another thing, no microphones. But the surrounding by people is what's crazy. Because today we got so much, so many concerns about safety and security and all that kind of a stuff. Well, maybe they needed to be concerned because in this picture, I'm gonna give you a blow up. 25 feet away from Abraham Lincoln is standing. Yeah, look at that. This guy right here, Menace. blow up, is John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth was present for the speech. John Wilkes Booth was a Southerner, okay, through, through, through the core. He was from Maryland, but his heart was with the Deep South. He was a slavery guy. He was a racist. He hated Abraham Lincoln. He attended this inauguration with his girlfriend, who was the daughter of a senator, and he is just growing in his anger towards Abraham Lincoln. He actually brags to a friend later. He says, I was 25 feet away from the president. I could have killed him if I wanted to. So what do you think his friend said? Why didn't you? His friend said, so why didn't you? You ever been like anti up on a bet like that? He's like, ooh, why, you know, you why, you why did you? Why did you? Know these guys this day. starts the anger yeah, that is going to lead to John Wilkes Booth killing Abraham Lincoln. So crazy that these two men, they got another rendezvous with destiny about a month later. And, of course, that's going to change the world. Uh, when John Wilkes Booth killed Abraham Lincoln. That's a sad fact about Abraham Lincoln, but I do want to round out with some fun facts about Abraham Lincoln. Who here would say I'm a dog person? I like dogs. Who would say I'm a cat person? Lindy, are you a cat person? TJ, you're a cat person? Well, then guess what? You're an Abraham Lincoln person. Abraham Lincoln liked kitty cats, and this is a true story. He, uh, he was prone to depression. Okay, Back then, it wasn't called depression. It was called melancholy. So he's prone to depressive bouts and melancholy, and to uh, to make himself feel better or to lift his spirits, he would play with the family's cats. And it's hard for me. It's kind of hard to imagine, right? The president, six feet four inches tall, the leader of the world, he rolls on the ground playing with his kitty cats, and it is said that he would even purr and make cat sounds with his cats. So hard to imagine Abraham Lincoln Dad, doing that, but apparently it is the truth. Based off, uh, He's a cool <laughs>
Should I put that on the wall that he's a cat lover? Yeah. 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 All right, one more for you. Did I tell TJ? I'm gonna let TJ. TJ, come on up. Come on up. You don't even know what you're about to do. TJ, tell that us of this next me, slide. TJ. Tell us of this next slide. Tell us what's going on here. Tell us your story. Oh, yes. The reason that this gets fixed. <laughs> An 11-year-old girl named Grace Fidel in October of 1860 wrote a letter to then, I think it was, was the candidate, candidate uh, Abraham Lincoln, saying, I have yet got four brothers and part of them will vote for you any, anyway. anyway. Some of them are going to vote for you anyway, but and if you let your whiskers grow, I will try and get the rest of them to vote for you. Will look a great deal better for your face is so thin. All the ladies like whiskers, and they would tease their husbands to vote for you, and then you would be 11 year old girl. TJ, very good. TJ shared that story story earlier this week. I found the exact quote literally, an 11 year old girl says, Dude, you'll look better if you have a beard, and all the women will like you, and they'll vote for you. So Abraham Lincoln grows a beard because of this 11-year-old girl's letter. You think he looks like what? Creepy. He looks creepy. Third block said he looks like a vampire. Yeah. See that Dark Shadows. Yeah. He looks like Johnny Depp's character from Dark Shadows. Dark I see that. I see that. I see that. Or the, uh, yeah, I see that. Oh. I see that. Um, here's another one for you. Now, time is hard on anybody. Okay, People age. They get wrinkles around their eyes. But time was really hard on Abraham Lincoln. This is 1861. This is 1865. Four years. Look how much he aged in four. I would say that's stress. Years. Not age. Yo, that's yeah, but he aged, right? Oh, he aged yeah. because of the stress. Uh, his eyes, his wrinkles, everything. Man, that guy got old. Fast. Leading a country through the war, you can imagine that that would happen. So we talked about how he got to enjoy the surrender of Robert E. Lee for all of five days. Before the fateful night, April 14th, 1865, he is assassinated at the theater. And I'm gonna spend I'm gonna give you a whole day talking about this later this week, so I'm not gonna give you all the details right now. This is something that this has been in the room all semester long, whether you even know it or not. This is called Abraham Lincoln's Life Mask. Now it's not his death mask, it's his life mask. It was cast on his face in the last couple months of his life. And from the cast, from the plaster cast, they're able to make these uh, these other molds. I've got a friend who does 3D printing, and uh, he said, "Hey man, you want me to print anything for your class?" And I was like, "Bro, I was like, I don't know. What can you do?" He found this mold of Abraham Lincoln's death life mask, and he printed this. And I think it's slightly smaller than life size, and I think yeah. that his face would be a little bit bigger. But I don't know about you, but I'm amazed that I can hold Abraham Lincoln's face in my hands and kind of. Check out his so if it's not too creepy, you want to see it. I'll pass that around if you wish. All of this talk about Abraham Lincoln, if you're interested in knowing more, there's a fantastic movie simply called Lincoln. It stars Daniel Day Lewis and uh, TJ. I have a feeling. Yeah, James, come fetch. Don't you throw my A. No, sir. Stand up and come again. TJ, I have a feeling you know what this is. Do you know what method acting is? Yeah, yeah where you get yourself in the light. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So there are certain actors who do the method acting. Jared Leto and Joker, I think, That's did it, right? <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis, he lived like Abraham Lincoln for about four months. He took on, like, he would not answer to his own name. He ate what Lincoln ate. He, he uh, wore what Lincoln would wear. So he was a method actor taking on the role of Lincoln. Uh, and it makes for a really good movie. And the movie is based on a book called Team of Rivals. What do you think this Team of Rivals was for Lincoln? His place where he put his plates and cups. Cabinet, yeah. Lincoln built his cabinet out of men who hated each other. They were rivals. They were rivals. So it's like George Washington. Just similar, yeah, to George Washington bringing in rivals. And, you know, Lincoln's political genius is that he would bring people together. Obviously, we know he brought the whole country together, and that's pretty notable. Uh, and then if you're really interested in knowing more, the History Channel has done a phenomenal three-part miniseries called Abraham Lincoln. And this is what we watched our video from yesterday, that speech for the Gettysburg Address. So 
Sometimes the History Channel does weird stuff like aliens, and sometimes the History Channel does really good stuff like LinkedIn. What you got? Uh, what about the totally accurate movie, Abraham Lincoln Vampire? <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then, Abraham Lincoln, sorry, even visits the Alma Bacon County Public Library and reads books to our children. And I oh, freaking looking fellow, if you ask me. <laughs> we had a large audience that day. It was my daughter plus three others. Uh, I read a book at the library this summer. I dressed up as Abraham Lincoln, and it was pretty fun. What you got? Yes, you do. What? Who's the next I don't know what I'm talking about. These are not the droids that you're looking for. Yes, they are. All right, let's roll on to Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis was the president of the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis was the first and only president of the Confederacy because they only had one. He was elected in 1861. He was formerly a senator from Mississippi, but when Mississippi seceded, so did he. Uh, you know, for being the only elected president, he actually didn't have a lot of support. A lot of state governors didn't like him. There was a lot of fighting that happened overall. So uh, for only having one shot at picking a president, the Confederacy did not do a very good job. Uh, Jefferson Davis is the namesake of the Hazelhurst County seat, Jeff Davis County. And when I get done telling you about Jefferson Davis, you're going to wonder why. Why did they pick Jeff Davis as their county seat name? And maybe, just maybe, someone somewhere will decide that that should change someday because Jefferson Davis was not a very good guy and not someone that you would really want to name your city after. So I, I'm not from here, I, I know that. I continue to be amazed at some of the Confederate legacy that hangs on around South Georgia, especially things like Jeff Davis County being named after the president of the Confederacy. So, it's, so I, think if pe I think if people understood their namesake a little bit better, they wouldn't want to choose to be named after that person in the first place. What's your question? Who was your bad man? Huh? Was he a bad well, I'm, I'm about to tell you. I'm about to tell you. I mean, for starters, Alex, he broke away from the Union. He uh, represented the slaveholding South. He was a slave owner, and he was a rebel to the United States government. I mean, that's my, that's my starting position. And yeah. I love how down here, like this area of the United States, I was talking about Georgia. If you bring up that fact, any of what you just said or what so you're about to like say, we don't we're called bacon. Call and you, if you bring that up anywhere, people will almost fight you about it. There is a TJ, there, there is something, without getting like mega in depth, there's something called the Lost Cause mythology, which is to say that Confederates were Christian fearing, you know, uh, the Southern economy, Southern way of life. People even say that, that the slaves had it better on plantation life than they had it out of slavery. And anyone that starts that line of conversation, quite frankly, it's impossible to change their mind. You know, whatever phrase you want to use, it's like arguing with a, with a wall or something. It is hard around here. I agree. I agree. Uh, Jefferson Davis, not my favorite fact about him, but he is a West Point graduate, class of 1828. So the same college that I went to brings us Jefferson Davis. And like I said, he's probably not our no most notable alumni. Uh, a couple of interesting stories about Jeff Davis. Oh, as a cadet, yeah. as a cadet, he inspired, he instigated the eggnog riot of 1826. Eggnog. As a cadet at West Point, they were having a Christmas dinner, Christmas banquet, and he and a couple of his buddies spiked the eggnog with alcohol, and then the cadets who were drinking all the alcohol got a little rowdy, so he got in trouble. He got some demerits for being part of the eggnog riot of 1826. Yeah, that's just kind of a silly story. Now, a little bit more notably, Jefferson Davis, he had experience in the Mexican-American War. Okay, a lot of these generals in the Civil War had experience in the Mexican-American War. He did not accept the surrender of Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee surrendered his army, and Davis was like, nope, we can keep fighting. So what he does is he starts to move to the south. He thinks that the Confederacy can fight a guerrilla warfare from the Deep South. And if they keep shooting and running, shooting and running, that the Yankees will go back north and leave them alone. A little bit delusional, but that is what he believed at the time. Until on May 10th, 1865, Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, is captured by Union troops. 
near Irwinville, Georgia, which is 55 miles to the west of where we're sitting right now. Jefferson Davis was captured right here in Georgia, 55 miles away, wearing, are you ready for it? Wearing his wife's dress is what you were, I thought you were going to say. Jefferson Davis was trying to hide in women's clothing, and he was caught by Union troops hopping the fence wearing his wife's dress. I got the can't make this up. I am not making this up. He was caught wearing women's clothing while trying to hide from the Yankee troops, the Union troops that were captured him. So if you are the Union, you've been fighting this guy for four years, and you finally capture him wearing women's clothing, what are you going to do with that information? First I'm going to laugh, and then I'm going to go stand up. And then you're going to tell the whole country. Yes, so he becomes known as the president in petticoats. And yes, it is advertised that Abraham Lincoln, who has been killed at this point, Abraham Lincoln was a great emancipator. Jefferson Davis was a president in a dress. So uh, take that legacy and do what you want with it. Uh, if you're in Hazelhurst, you're going to name your county after it. But I still really can't imagine why. That is my that is my spiel on Jefferson Davis. Alex, would you still want to name your county after Jefferson Davis? Yeah. Hold on, oh hold on. You said he owned slaves, but if you think about it, everybody that's not owned slaves. Okay, so should we name our counties after them? No, I'm just saying, like, I want to, I want to suggest that's a bad fact. It's just a fact, though. Okay. He's I'll a bad that. man. Just yeah. say no. Well, Alexia, are you naming your county after Jefferson Davis? No. Yeah, All, right. <laughs> All right, let's plow through four generals, and we'll be done for the day. Ulysses S. Grant, he's a Union general. He's aggressive. He's the one that Lincoln has always been looking for. He's the one that started to turn the tide of the war for the Union. A lot of the early Union generals were failures. Because they were timid, they were shy, they wouldn't fight. Grant is the opposite of that. Grant is aggressive. He's a brawler. He is. Uh, he is said to be have a struggle with alcohol, and I think earlier in his career he did. He did. Yeah, he did. But I, I think he matured into his position in his later years, and he was the right man for the job at the time. He was arrested for speeding in Washington D.C. with his horse and buggy. This yeah. is true. I, I know this. That is that's a good fact, T.J. Uh, he wears the rank of a three-star general which he was the first three-star general since George Washington. So when Lincoln promoted him to that rank, he was giving him all of the credentials of George Washington. So kind of a big deal. Uh, does anybody want to take a guess? Does anybody want to take a guess as to where Ulysses S. Grant went to college? West Point. West Point, class of 1843 is correct. He also has experience in the Mexican-American War. Like, like many of these generals did. So he's West Point class of 1843. Uh, he goes on to be the 18th president, but that's not exactly what we're talking about today. We're talking about his military uh, perspective uh, overall. And when you're done writing, I'm going to show you some pictures from his life, some pictures across his lifetime. Later? I will. Uh, 18, oh, yeah. West Point class of 1843. So... As you see these different years, you can see that these guys, maybe they didn't necessarily cross paths, but they are all from the same background. And that's why I'm highlighting the West Point background in them. One, it's my personal background and I like telling the story. But two, it, showed, it goes to show you that they had a common training. They had a common academic background. And also, West Pointers are pretty close knit. And when the war came, just like it split families, it also split the army in half. Northerners stayed with the Union. Southerners went with their states, and you got a lot of guys that used to be best friends. Maybe they fought alongside each other in a different war. Now they're on other sides of the civil war. I have a question. What's up? So the guy who got replaced, uh, Ulysses S. S. Grant, okay. he ran for president. So did he get handcuffed? Because you know, I think it was like, no, you can't do it. Which guy? What are you talking about? Uh, oh, McClellan? McClellan. I'm not sure McClellan got arrested uh, directly. It was mostly, so back to habeas corpus, yeah, it was mostly uh, publishers and writers, uh -oh. maybe smaller time politicians. I don't think that's a great question. I don't think McClellan came under that, uh, although that would have been an excessive use of presidential power. Yeah. You make me curious, though. I'm going to have to look it up. Here's a picture of younger Grant. Uh, and you can see that his beard's a little bit longer. Yeah, TJ, TJ notices that. His wife said, I don't like it. You better trim it up. So I think it's funny. You got Lincoln who gets told to grow a beard, and you got Grant who gets told by his wife to trim it up. He does trim it up, and this is typically the picture of Grant that you see a little bit more frequently. I think he's a good-looking fella. Right? He's rough. He was a muddy boot soldier. He was a fighter. He got his hands dirty. He was a brawler. Here's another picture of him. 
This next picture right here, I really like this. This was 24 cameras at the same time taking a panoramic photo. So pretty cool that they were experimenting with photography in that way. And how do we honor President Grant in our pocketbooks these days? $50 bill. I don't come into contact with the TV. If I'm going to be completely honest, I never pay attention to TV on the money. Well, exactly. but after, Alexia, you know what winning would be for me? After this class, you do. Right? <laughs> okay. Seriously, like that's what I go for in this Let class. I want to make you more. Yeah. Well, so that's the next thing. <laughs> I myself more. don't come into contact with $50 bills all that often. So, uh, but when I do, I can know that, that you have uh, General Grant. Actually, President Grant is on the dollar bills right there. Uh, I'll round out his life for you. He goes on to become president, but after his presidency, he's got kind of a sad story. He makes a bad financial investment, and he goes broke. And in his last days, he's broke. He has throat cancer, and he's dying not like in a place of honor, but kind of as a sad old man because he's out of money and he's out of time. Now, why do you think he has throat cancer? Alcohol. Because of alcohol. Uh, nope, the other one. Tobacco. Tobacco. Yeah. Don't oh. chew, don't smoke, don't do cigars, don't do dip, because you'll be like Ulysses S. Grant, you'll get, you'll get throat cancer. Yeah. To make sure that his family had money after he you're died, saying, saying, he very saying, hurriedly, listen to this, he very hurriedly wrote his autobiography. And he actually finished only three days before dying. <laughs> so literally the last days of his life, he was writing his autobiography. It publishes, it makes money, and his family has some money after he dies. But kind of a sad end of his story because of how he went broke and then that he died from cancer. Here's a pretty powerful quote about Grant. This is from Sherman. It is said that it will be a thousand years before Grant's character is fully appreciated. Grant is the greatest soldier of our time, if not of all time. Sometimes you're too close to the history to really respect what's been going on, right? Someday, 50 years from now, we'll look at 2022 with clearer eyes. 100 years from now, we'll see this era with clearer eyes. Grant may have been controversial at the time, but Sherman is affirming his character. He's saying he's the greatest soldier of our time, if not of all time. History Channel also does a good job with Grant. Moving on. William Tecumseh Sherman, not George's favorite son, because why? He kind of burned half. Yeah. He burned Atlanta to the ground, and then he marches to the sea, and he burns everything between Atlanta and Savannah to the ground. So we talked about that yesterday. Again, y'all, you can shorthand. You don't have to write every single word. He uses a scorched earth strategy, which means burning not just military targets, everything. but also farms and railroads and crops and livestock and really taking a toll on the civilian population as well. Sherman did not, I believe, I genuinely believe Sherman did not want to do that. Sherman did not want to cause destruction. Sherman wanted to end the war. Yeah. He wanted to bring the South to its knees. And how are you going to do that? you got to cripple it economically. So this was a Sherman's scorched earth strategy. And hope, too, because like, what do you find in scorched earth? Uh, hope, fight. yeah, take the hope away from him. I like that. That's a great thought as well. Uh, I'm curious, does anyone wonder where William comes to Sherman went to college? West Point. As a matter of fact, it was West Point, class of 1840. He was second, or excuse me, he was ranked sixth in his class, which is pretty good uh, overall. I can say that. I can say that. Oh, sorry. I can say that I was not ranked sixth in my class overall. Um, something interesting about a lot of these guys, while you guys are still writing, I'll tell you a little bit more. Something interesting about a lot of these guys is they had their military career. Most of them left the military. But then when the Civil War came, they came back to the military. So a lot of these guys, not a lot of these guys were career officers that just rolled into the Civil War. A lot of them had a break in their military service. But then when their country needed them, they came back uh, to the military and they helped out. So Sherman and Grant were friends from civilian life. Uh, after the Mexican-American War, they actually interacted with each other a little bit. Grant went broke. And Sherman kind of gave him a leg up, gave him a small loan, you know, as a personal friend. So those two interacted before the war. And then ironically, Grant becomes the superior, and Sherman and Sherman is like subordinate to him. PJ, I'm just saying, like I understand why Sherman, you know, burned half of our state. Okay, why? To cripple the Confederacy, kind of split the uh, Confederacy in half, really, if you take out all the farms and everything. Yep. Yeah. Down there but I in my mind I just seen it is there's like this invisible wall between civil like the, the civilians and the actual people you're fighting 
And that's war like, is a tough thing, PJ. Were you here yesterday? No, no. I don't think so. We, we talked about Sherman yesterday. yesterday. We oh, talked about Marshall yesterday. Yeah, well, yeah, you missed him falling out of his chair. I did yeah, fall out of his chair. Yeah, and the camera yeah. wasn't on, and I wish it had been. All right, West Point Class Up. So, something else cool about Sherman. Any LSU fans here? LSU. He was the first superintendent of Louisiana State University, LSU, SEC, SEC. Now, it wasn't called LSU like it is today, but it was the forerunner of LSU. So that's kind of cool. Uh, but when Louisiana seceded, he left He left that position. He said, I'm not a Southerner. I don't support slavery. Uh, and he left LSU at that point. A couple pictures for us, guys. We're rounding it out. I know I'm taking it right to the wire. Here he is overseeing Atlanta, just like we talked about yesterday. This guy right here, like, would you want to start a fight with that guy right there? Totally not. Yeah, totally not. But, but I think that he forgot something that morning. What was that? I think he forgot to brush his hair a little bit. This guy, I think this guy's looking for his flask, all right? I think this guy's looking for a gift or something because that that's a brawler right there, right? I would not want to mess with, mess with William Tecumseh Sherman. Now, as a recap from yesterday, here is the actual map of the construction. 37 days to go from Atlanta to Savannah, 50 miles wide, four different main marching routes, 285 miles in distance, burned to the ground all along the way. So a lot of major towns like McDonough and Covington and Milledgeville, like you can't, you can still drive to these places today and you would not find anything more recent than 1865 because it got burned to the ground in Virginia. Oh, thank <laughs> we for today? Whoa, what? We got them today, almost, huh? almost, almost. Good thing I got my white throat spray. You're not supposed yeah. to swallow it. Here it is. I don't care. Here's <laughs> what they were doing along the way. They were tearing up the railroads, and they were twisting the ties so that they would not be usable anymore. And they actually got called Sherman neckties, as if he was tying a tying a bow tie around his neck. Sherman neckties. These right here are at Cold Mountain, Georgia. So if you wanted to go and visit today, a little bit of history right around the state. You can do that. Sherman's neckties. Lexi, you want to go to Sherman's? You want to go to Cold Mountain? It was a little bit I moved away from the cold. I do not want to go back. <laughs> you don't like the cold? It's, it's just bad. called Cold Mountain. It's not physically cold. Okay. It's, it's like still cold. in Georgia. It's like, uh, hey, kind of along the lines of what TJ was saying. Hey, y'all, listen. Let me drive to the finish line here. Kind of along the lines of what TJ was saying. Sherman has this quote I'm sick and tired of war. War is hell. He did not want to keep fighting. He just wanted to end it. And it's a very powerful statement, and it is true. I've been to war. I can confirm war is hell. Alex? Can you go back to, like, two photos? Huh? What else? I mean, look at his face. You think he's going to be happy about it? Yeah, yeah. War is hell. War is definitely hell. Um, Sherman, in his later years, I, I love this picture because it just shows how everyone has aged, right? So this is his later years. This is in 1885. In 1884, he's asked to run for president. You know what he says? He says, if nominated, I will not accept. If elected, I will not serve. He's like, go ahead and vote me president. I won't show up to the White House. I do not want to have anything to do with politics. So pretty powerful statement. Yeah, right? He is not getting messed up with politics. All right, Robert E. Lee, two more. I'll go super fast. Robert E. Lee, we know he is a Confederate general. You know, he leads the Army of Northern Virginia. He's originally opposed to Southern secession. In fact, Abraham Lincoln offers him the job to command the Union Army. But Robert E. Lee says, I have to see what Virginia's gonna do. I will go with my home state of Virginia. When Virginia secedes his home state, he goes with the South. So that's also a part of the Southern mythology is that Robert E. Lee was a good Christian man and you know he didn't really want to rebel against the United States. Here's how I gotta leave it. He went with the slaveholding South, he rebelled against the federal government. He broke his oath to the army. That's his legacy. Okay, I don't care if he's a good Christian man. He did all those other things. So it's a really complex legacy. Uh, but ultimately, he chose gray, and that is the end of his legacy, as far as I'm concerned. When we say that the South had many more talented commanders, Robert E. Lee is definitely one of the ones we're talking about. He was able to make do with less. He had fewer people and fewer resources, but his military genius was able to win some battles that he probably should have lost. So early on, his military genius is what kind of kept the South in the war. And when we say that the South had the more, more talented commanders, he's definitely one of the ones that we're talking about uh, overall. 
Does anyone wonder where Robert E. Lee went to college? West. 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 As a matter of fact, he went to West Point, class of 1829. He was second in his class, and he got he had no demerits across all four years of college. Even your goody, shoe, goody two shoes teacher got a couple demerits at West Point. So Robert E. Lee not getting any demerits was kind of a big deal. He also goes back as the superintendent, and he's the superintendent at West Point for three years. Here's where his legacy at West Point is really complicated. There's buildings named after him. There's statues, there's paintings, there's monuments. He was a pretty significant part of West Point history, but he also rebelled against the United States. He also broke his army officer's oath and went with a foreign nation. So uh, really complex legacy. And there has been conversation about should we rename these places at West Point? And not just at West Point, but all across America as well. There's towns and schools <laughs> named after him. Yeah, and monuments, etc. So really complex legacy. Uh, Robert E. Lee says this, it is well that war is so terrible or we should grow too fond of it. He's saying if it was fun, we might go to war all the time. But it's not fun and we should really be measured about whether we go to war or not. Here's old man Lee. Something to his credit is as soon as the war was over, ladies, let me finish. As soon as the war was over, he led the way in bringing the country back together. He showed the South how to do it. He says, I'm laying my arms down. I signed an oath, back of allegiance to the United States. I'm fires. I'm just going to go be a private citizen. And that really set the stage for the South to come back to the United States. Uh, he goes on to be the president of It is originally called Washington College, but today it's called Washington and Lee College because of him. He is buried at Washington and Lee College. Now, this is not his grave. This is a statue, but this is his crypt. His body is behind these doors right here, and that's kind of controversial because why? What else do you see in the picture? A whole lot of rebel flags. Yeah, a bunch of rebel flags because he's literally the leader of the Confederate Army. So it's kind of a mixed legacy as to whether he should have these honors or not. Uh, and I'm just going to leave that one there, right? It's kind of too. Uh, it's it's really a really big topic to debate. Robert E. Lee's death mask, uh, and like I said, kind of a big topic to debate. Uh, also comes down to statues. This is the state capitol of Virginia in June of 2020, and this is Robert E. Lee's statue being removed from the state capitol of Virginia in June of 2020. Here's kind of where I stand on this, okay? I'm going to give you my opinion, which I don't usually do that a lot. I think that we can, it is entirely possible to not erase history, to acknowledge what happened, while also not elevating the, the villains of history. There are certain people in history that don't deserve a statue. There are certain people in history that don't deserve a memorialization. We can know what happened. We can talk about the good that they did, but also acknowledge the bad that they did. And we do not have to have statues of them because they did bad, and we don't want to elevate that. So Robert E. Lee got his statue removed after about 100 years. Uh, people are mixed on it. Some think that it was right. Some think people think it was not right. I will leave that to you to decide overall. Last one. Let's go. Gr grinding to the end here. Thomas Stonewall Jackson, he did not always have that nickname. He gains that nickname at the first battle of Bull Run. He is also one of those that is the essence of the more talented military commanders. Uh, he is Lee's right arm in many, many battles leading up to, unfortunately, his death. He is shot by his own troops by accident. Yeah, Alex is my It's called friendly fire, although I would offer there's no such thing as fire that is friendly. It, what happened was that one night he was riding a route and his own men, standing guard, thought that he was the enemy. Cha 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 cha. They shot into the night. He struck in the left arm. He's not killed immediately. His left arm is amputated, but from the amputation, he gets disease and he actually gets pneumonia and he dies of the pneumonia. So he's not dead from the shooting, but he is dead from the infection. And from the, from hey, the yeah. at least he knows that his guards are paying attention. Well, he did know that. I can't. I can't <laughs> fight you on that one. Did this <laughs> show that <laughs> shot him into dying for that? Or what? Uh, great question. I don't know what happened to those soldiers. Uh, I don't know. That's a very good question. Um, uh, so this happens right before the Battle of Gettysburg, and we know that we know that the South loses the Battle of Gettysburg. A lot of people wonder if, if Jackson had been in Gettysburg, would it have been different? If Jackson had been in Gettysburg, would Lee have been able to win with one of his more competent commanders? I say it doesn't matter because it's not what happened, and we can't fight history that didn't happen. 
So, uh, so it's kind of a, you know, it's, it's something that we'll never know because he wasn't there. Does anybody wonder where Stonewall Jackson went to college? Don't change it, and I know what it is. <laughs> West Point, I'm writing something. Thomas Stonewall Jackson, West Point class of 1846. Yes, he is another one of us, uh, and uh, as were many Civil War generals. Um, so I'll round it out while you guys are writing. He also had statues removed at the end of, uh, you know, it, throughout 2020. And it is also kind of, a, you know, along the lines of controversial, should we erase the history or should we elevate these people? And it's the same conversation that we kind of opened up uh, earlier as well. So hang on with me. I'm not quite done. He did go to West Point, class 1846. James, I'll go back in a second if I need nice. to. A couple pictures here, just rounding it out. Listen, I want you to pay attention to this. Let me finish right here. This is a variety of the West Pointers that also fought in the Civil War. I'm not going to go over each of them right now. Here is my really short plug for Army recruiting. If you're interested in the military or the academy, I would love to talk to you about it. There's a reason I passionately share about this. Part of my background is because it changed my life. And maybe, just maybe, it could change your life if you're interested in hearing more. You can see that West Point has been a part of our country's fabric for a long time starting with its founding by Thomas Jefferson in 1802, taking a step past back, back past that, George Washington was there during the Revolution. In fact, it's valuable enough that Benedict, Benedict Arnold is going to try to give it away. There is a saying of West Pointers, because West Point uniform is gray. So the saying is that we are called the long gray line. And then there's a really powerful poem that says, the long gray line of us stretches through the years of the century told. And that is why I feel a connection to these former West Pointers, North and South, when they graduated, they were cadets. They kind of had the same cadet experience that I had when I graduated in 2010. So there is a history and a shared history that I like talking about. And that is why I continue to bring it to you here in the classroom. Uh, it is said at West Point that much of the history we teach is made by the people we taught. And you just, you really just can't ignore the history that comes out of West Point. So many of the characters in the story of us, the story of U.S. history, come through, came through the halls of West Point. And it's not just that I love the Academy so much, I do, but it's that you really can't even tell the story of U.S. history without talking about these people. So I'm wearing my West Point shirt for a reason today, and I know that that's probably a bunch of West Point overload, but I enjoy talking about it, and I'm trying to inspire you to know more as well. What class did he um, graduate from? Which? Um, Jackson? No, Stonewall. Yeah, what was it? 1840? 1846. 1846. There you have it. James, thank you for diligently writing down everything that came across your screen today. Let me round it out with this. I know what time it is. This is not, I'm not picking these up till Wednesday of next week, but I encourage you to not delay. I made a Google Classroom post, and what I want you to do is read one of the articles I posted. You can choose and read more about one of these figures. If you like Harriet Tubman, read about Harriet Tubman. If you like Ulysses S. Grant, read about him. Write down eight facts that you uh, that you learned about this character. If you have a digital connection issue, I have printed off an article, and you can just choose to go with this particular article. Okay? This is due on Wednesday of next week. Don't neglect it. Because if you miss this whole page of notes, you miss a significant portion of the uh, of the grade for these notes as well. Okay? I know there was time in class, and I apologize for that, but it's something that you can accomplish between now and Wednesday. Okay, I'm done talking. You may get your phones and round it out for today. Does anybody need this printed article? Nope. I'll find a way. I'll find a way to do it there in the other bus. Take one. Take one. I know that you have a rule that you Beat Navy! No! Or 